Shall we bow? Shall we pray? Gracious God, we thank you for all that our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our hearts have received in this worship experience. We pray now, God, that as your word continues to go forth, that the power of your Holy Spirit would open and continue to open our hearts and ears to receive that which you are sharing in this place. Hide me behind the cross and keep me under the drippings of your blood. God, we need to hear a word from you in this season. So please have your way in us and with us and through us. And whatever it is you choose to do, and however you choose to do it, whatever it is you choose to say, and however you choose to say it, we'll be careful to say that Jesus said it. For it is in the strong name of Jesus that we pray and ask it all. And the people of God said together, Amen. The scripture has already been read in our hearing. However, I'd like to lift up a few verses coming to us from Acts, Acts chapter 2. Beginning at the 12th verse, these words are found. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. And for the next few minutes, the topic of our teaching shall be lost in translation. Lost in translation. To know God and to make God known. That was the mission and the motto of Friendship Community Church. It was in each and every bulletin. It was printed on the church stationery. There was even a sign in the vestibule of the church as soon as you walked in, in big, bold writing, to know God and to make God known. Simple yet profound. And if you ask the members of Friendship Community Church how well they were doing in fulfilling their motto and mission, they would say they were doing an excellent job. If you asked exactly how they fulfilled their mission and motto to know God and to make God known, they would quickly refer to the events that they held on an annual basis, opening up their doors to members of their congregation and their community to let others know about the love of Jesus Christ. These annual events were Men's Day, Women's Day, Youth Day, Church Anniversary, and Family and Friends Day. And on these special Sundays, they would roll out the red carpet. The choir stand would be full and they would sing to the glory of God. The ministerial staff was robed and pristine. The ushers were in their starched uniform and everything ran like a well-oiled machine. On those Sundays, they would advertise, they would publicize, and the church would be packed. They would even have chairs in the aisles. The pastor would preach a stirring sermon, and following worship, they would gather together in the fellowship hall for refreshments. And if the weather was nice, they would even go outside for food and fellowship. However, over the course of years, these annual events became stagnant. They became a little too familiar, a little too routine. And what members of the congregation was noticing, they noticed that these events, while they were great in the life of the church, they did not necessarily grow the church. They invited people in, but it wasn't clear if they were really making God known. Over the years, the congregation itself began to shrink, not all at once, not overnight. But little by little, as members moved away or passed away or grew up and began to go to college and other places, the congregation was just a little bit smaller. However, they were a strong and healthy congregation committed to their motto to know God and to make God known. A new pastor was appointed to Friendship Community Church. And he got with the program of the annual days as a means to know God and to make God known. But what he noticed is that their church wasn't growing because of these events, that it was just pew swapping. That members would invite family and friends that belonged to other churches to come on special days. And in return, they would visit these other congregations on their special days. So the pastor with a group of members decided that they would do something bold, something new, something different. 
that as part of their Christian education outreach, that they would host a vacation Bible school, not only for the young people of the congregation, but the entire community. They sent out flyers, they advertised, they publicized. And there was an overwhelming number of young people who came to the vacation Bible school. However, these young people weren't churched. They screamed and ran throughout the church and the sanctuary. They chewed gum and drank pop in the pews of the sanctuary, and they were constantly being corrected and scolded. The young brothers wore their hats, and the sisters weren't necessarily dressed in church attire for these events. And so the members, very frustrated and flustered, they couldn't understand that this new generation of young people had not grown up at Friendship Community Church or anyone's church for that matter. And it seemed as if they were speaking two different languages. The staid members of the church and the members of the community, there was this disconnect. At the end of the two week vacation Bible school, the members voted unanimously that they would not do that again. Why? Because it was too stressful. They decided that they would stick with their annual days of Men's Day and Women's Day and Youth Sunday even though the number of young people in the church was becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. My brothers and sisters, Friendship Community Church only exists in my imagination. However, I have pastored Friendship Community Church, not literally, but figuratively. Every church I have been blessed and privileged to serve, including this one, strong and healthy congregations whose desire is to know God and to make God known. Every church that I have served has had wonderful and well-meaning members who have been a blessing to me and my family. However, every church that I have served, both as an associate and as a pastor, has had to grapple with this question of what does it mean to connect with the community which is changing. Yes, including here at Bethel AME Church, a congregation that I love dearly. Yes, we do represent part of this community and for 164 years we have been that beacon of hope and help and strength for not only the members of our congregation, but this entire city. But brothers and sisters, things are changing in the world in which we live, and sometimes it feels as if we speak a different language than the people who live in the community where we sit, stand, and serve. There was research done last year by the Pew Foundation, which suggested for the first time in the statistical data that had been kept that the United States of America has fewer than 50% of its citizens who are affiliated with a church or a synagogue. That 47% of United States citizens are affiliated with a church or a synagogue, which means 53%, the majority of our nation has no religious affiliation. And for those who go to church on a regular basis, it's not an every Sunday thing, but average church attendance, even for those who are committed, is two Sundays out of the month. That the church that we love and the church that has been so much a part of our life is now in an era in which most people don't have a religious affiliation. And in order for us to be the church that God desires and has designed us to be, we have to be multilingual. We have to be able to speak church ease. You know what church ease is. It's the language and the nomenclature with which many of us are familiar. It is the language that we speak on Sunday morning when I stand and say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It's the language of the King James Version of the Bible and the hymns that we sing that were written by John Wesley over 200 years ago. Yes, that's part of who we are. That's our tradition. But at the same time, if we want to be able to connect to the people whom God sends our way, we have to be able to speak a different language. 
We have to be able to speak a language that meets the needs of mothers who have lost children to gun violence. We have to be able to speak the language that meets the needs of families that are trying to figure out and find out exactly how they move forward in the midst of this pandemic. We've got to be able to speak the language of men and women who are struggling to make ends meet. We have to be able to speak to those individuals whom God sends our way. And while that is a challenge for many of us, and while that is a challenge for the church, not simply Bethel, but every single church in this nation, brothers and sisters, there is good news. There is good news because today is Pentecost, the day in which we celebrate the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that guides us and guards us. It's the Holy Spirit that lifts us and leads us. It's the Holy Spirit that allows us to receive the power and the life force that makes discipleship and ministry possible. Yes, today is Pentecost and we praise God because the Spirit is with us, the Spirit is in us, and the Spirit propels us to do God's work and God's will. However, the Spirit doesn't come simply for us to have wonderful worship on Sunday, whether that's in person or virtually. The Spirit doesn't simply come so that we can have charismatic and ecstatic worship experiences and praise events. The Spirit doesn't simply come so that we can feel warm and cozy and comfortable inside the four walls of the sanctuary or the four walls of our home, but the Spirit empowers us to speak speak truth to power and to speak to those who are in need. That's what we see in this morning's passage of scripture. The word tells us that the disciples are gathered together following the instructions of Jesus. For 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus spent time with the disciples, that he appears in different places and at different times to reassure them that he certainly has risen from the dead. As he ascends into heaven, he gives them the instructions to wait on the advocate, the comforter, the Holy Spirit that will give them power and teach them all things. And in concurrence with what Jesus has shared with them and in obedience to the word and the instruction that they have received, they gather together in Jerusalem and they pray and they fast and they watch and they wait for this spirit, this power that they don't know what it looks like. They don't know when it will come or how it will show up, but they are willing to trust in the Lord. And I'm just wondering today if there are those of us who are willing to wait and watch and trust in God, that the move of God might do something in our lives, in our homes, in our families during this time, something that we cannot do for ourselves. And in their watching and waiting, something happens. The word says that there was the sound, the sound of a violent rushing wind and the Holy Spirit appears in the room where they are. And it was the appearance appearance of fire, flames, tongues of fire that rested on the heads of each, and it gave them the supernatural ability not to praise and to pray, but rather to speak in different languages and proclaim the good news of Almighty God. Why was this so very appropriate? Well, it was because in the midst of of Jerusalem, the city was also hosting one of the high and holy festivals, the festivals in which gathered men and women from all over the Jewish world that they might come to Jerusalem, that they might pay their vow, that they might worship and connect with their faith. And this international gathering that has crowded the city they happen to be there at the same time that the Holy Spirit falls. And as the Spirit falls upon the disciples, the disciples leave the house where they are and they begin to talk to different people in different languages so that they're able to hear and understand the word of Almighty God and God's great deeds of power. Brothers and sisters, it must have been amazing that these brothers, these Galileans, these men from this backwater outpost in Israel are now able to speak fluently in different languages. Yeah, it must have been awesome. However, 
as we see in this passage of scripture, there was something that was lost in translation. Because while they proclaimed God's deeds of power, the word says that those who heard in their own language, they were bewildered and confused. Some sneered and said they must be drunk. Well, brothers and sisters, I've been around intoxicated people before. And there might be some symptoms or some signs of intoxication, but being able to speak in a language that you've never learned is not one of them. And that's just an indication that when people don't understand, they will begin to come up with theories and ideas that have nothing to do with what God is actually doing. However, we must do exactly what God tells us to do, regardless of what someone else thinks. That in order for us to be the church that God has called us to be in this season of Pentecost and at this time, there are several things that we must do. First of all, we must watch and wait for the spirit to move us. When it comes to church growth and these statistics that I have just shared, many people become anxious and we try to think of new ideas of how we can grow our church, how we can be more relevant, how we can be more impactful. And yes, all of that is important. But if it's not led by the Holy Spirit, then we might grow our church. But our church may be a mile wide and an inch deep. That we've got to watch and wait for the Holy Spirit to lead us to do that which God has called us to do. That there is no church growth campaign, that there is no congregational effort that can precede the Holy Spirit, that we've got to watch together and wait together and fast together and pray together until the Holy Spirit leads us to meet the needs that God desires us to meet. Yes, we've got to watch and wait on the Holy Spirit that it might empower us and equip us and inspire us to make a difference in the places where God wants us to be. Because without the Spirit, we can do nothing. It's the Spirit that puts wind in our sails. It's the Spirit that puts gas in our tanks. It's the Spirit that puts running in our feet. It's the Spirit that leads us to the places where God wants us to go. Not only must we watch and wait for the Holy Spirit, but brothers and sisters, we must be willing to leave the place where we are. It would be wonderful if everyone whom God wants us to encounter were to meet us here at 900 John A. Woods at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. But the truth of the matter is, we're not even here at 900 John A. Woods 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. But rather, we must go to the places where God sends us. The word says that the disciples were in the house, but when the spirit fell upon them, they then left and went outdoors to meet the people where they were. So very often, we believe that that term open doors means that other people could come on in. And yes, it does. It does mean that our doors are open for others to come in. But by the same token, I believe when we say that we are a church of open doors, that means that we who are the body of Christ, we who are those called by God, that it is our job to open the doors so that we can leave and go to meet people where they are. Yes, God wants us to leave our comfort zones every now and again. God wants us to walk out of these spaces and into the world that God has before us. God desires us to meet people where they are. And it may not always be convenient or comfortable. It may not always be pristine. But if God calls us to those spaces, wherever God desires us to be, that's where we have to show up. Brothers and sisters, because that's exactly what Jesus did that Jesus didn't wait for people to come to him, that there were times in which Jesus went out to meet people where they were. It was Jesus who was in the midst of the crowd when he felt that 
power leave his body. Why? Because in the crowd, in the midst, in the press, there was a woman who had a need. When Jairus' daughter had died, they didn't bring the deceased girl to Jesus, but rather Jesus went to the girl and said, little girl, get up. When he lost his brother Lazarus, Jesus didn't wait for them to bring Lazarus' body to him, but rather Jesus went there to that place and, and that space, and he said, Lazarus, come out. And if Jesus was willing to go to meet the needs of others, so must we be willing to leave the places where we are to go meet the needs that God has for us to meet. We must be able to watch and wait we must be able to leave the places where we are. And finally, my brothers and sisters, we've got to be able to live with the tension. Well, what are you talking about, Pastor? Well, everybody won't agree with you. Everybody won't accept the message that you have. People might have speculations and sneer. But that's all right. We ought to expect that tension. In fact, Jesus even tells his disciples as he sends them forth that there will be some homes and villages that don't accept you and don't affirm your gift, your calling or your message. That there may be people who consider church people hypocrites, that there may be people who consider Christians naive, but yet and still we've got to share that message of love. We've got to be willing and able to share to those individuals who may not have ever heard about the love of God, who may not have ever experienced the salvific relationship with Jesus Christ. We've got to be able to share within the word. And it doesn't mean that we are evangelists or prophets or that we know the Bible cover to cover. Maybe it's just sharing our own testimony. Maybe it's just being able to say that I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. You may not be a theologian who is able to explain every aspect of Christianity, but maybe you could say that I was once lost in sin and then Jesus took me in and a little light from heaven filled my soul. My brothers and sisters, you may not be able to preach a sermon or quote every scripture in the Bible. But maybe you're able to share with someone, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That yes, there are those who may not accept us and affirm us and welcome us with open arms, but we still must go and tell the world about Jesus and his love. Because for that one person whose life might be changed, for that one individual who might be inspired, for that one person who might come to belief, then all of it is worth it. That in life, God calls us to go to those that God sends us to and to share the love of Almighty God. And we can do it. And we can do it because as you continue to read in that passage, it was Peter who stands up and declares the word of Joel. It was Peter who stands up and proclaims the message of Jesus. As you continue to read, it was Peter, yes, the knife carrying, cussing, non-water walking Peter whom God had touched who is filled with the Holy Spirit that's able to preach and proclaim the good news. Yeah, that Peter. The Jesus denying Peter. The brother who couldn't get it right, Peter. Yeah, that same Peter God uses now filled with the Spirit to preach with such power that hundreds, thousands end up giving their lives to Jesus. And if God could do it in Peter, then God can do it in us. We just have to be willing to watch and to wait. We've got to be willing to leave the places we are. And we've got to be willing to live with that tension. Because it's in the tension where we grow, where we gain strength where we become better, wiser, and stronger, not for our own sakes, but for God's glory. And as we do that, God is glorified and his kingdom is blessed indeed. Amen and amen.
my brothers, my sisters, first and foremost, let me share that Bethel is an awesome and extraordinary family of faith. I believe that in this season, God is stretching us to do even more and to do even greater because there are men and women who need to hear the awesome news of God's power, God's love, and God's salvation. If you are that man, that woman, that boy, that girl who has never received that message, well, I pray that you will receive it today, that you will accept Jesus into your hearts. And if you don't belong to a church, then know that I would love to be your pastor and we would love to be your church family. And let me also take a moment of pastoral privilege even in the midst of this invitation. If there are those who are viewing, who have in any way felt excluded from this church or any church for that matter, know that you are welcome in this place. You are exactly the person that God desires and wants to be a member, to be a part of this family of faith. And so yes, we come with open arms and open hearts to receive those whom God will send our way. If that's you, I want you to pray with me this prayer. Almighty God, into your presence we come and God, we say thank you. We thank you because even in the midst of our human language, which we can sometimes lose your meaning and message of love. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would speak clearly to draw anyone who so desires and who needs a relationship with you, that you would draw them closer. So even now, God, allow those of us who are not saved but desire a relationship with you Allow us to confess with our lips that Jesus is Lord and open our hearts that we might believe that he has been raised from the dead. And it's on that confession and belief that we can be saved, that we can be reconnected, that you can reimagine a life for us that we can't imagine for ourselves. And for those who are not members of this church or any church for that matter, God, we pray that you would draw them closer that you would allow us the opportunity to serve as their church family. And even now, God, for the things that we may have done that have excluded anyone in your family, we repent and ask for your forgiveness. I pray that you would give us yet another chance to be the body of Christ. This is our prayer, and we pray it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. My brother, my sister, if that's you, if you need salvation, if you need a relationship, if you need prayer, if you have questions, if you need a church home, won't you please reach out to us? You can call us, you can write us, you can email us. Any way that you can reach out to us, please do so, so that we might meet you where you are, and together we might be the people that God has called us to be. Amen. Receive now the benediction. May the love, grace, and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let it rest, let it rule, let it abide with you now, henceforth, and even forevermore. And the people of God said together, Amen. Go in peace.